her crop. And this was after the cover crop. And they applied no fertilizer to this cover crop. This is all from biological activity. Now the cover crop contained a lot of legumes. So that explains the jump in nitrogen, but look in the jump in phosphorus. This is, you know, there was no phosphorus added to this field. This is all from biological activity, making phosphorus more available. Because if you look at these root hairs and these are these little threads here, mycorrhizal fungi and all these little specks here are bacteria being fed by those mycorrhizal fungi, which are fed by the roots. And those fungi and those bacteria are able to burrow through this is rock, this is solid rock, and this is mycorrhizal fungi covered in bacteria that are burrowing through that rock, and making things available. And then you can also control weeds with cover crops. We see this field, left half of this field has a dry cover crop on it, to the right does not. And you see there's no weeds there's all kinds of weeds over here, but no weeds over here. How, how, does, how does this rye cover crop control weeds? Well, one thing that it does, the previous crop here was corn. The rye sucked up all the leftover nitrogen and converted it into this mulch. So it's, it's not available to the weeds. There's no nitrogen left in the soil. It's all taken up and put into this mulch. And the soybeans, they're a legume, they make their own nitrogen. So what you've done is you've used the cover crop to shift the balance of power, create conditions where soybeans can thrive, but the weeds can't. And then you say, well, that's fine for soybeans, but that won't work for corn. Well, maybe it can actually. You see any weeds in this cornfield? Oh. Ask pe people, I say, how would you, would you like to know what kind of herbicide they're using on this? They didn't use any herbicide on this field. This is actually an organic farmer. Here's the only thing he did. He used this roller crimper and a hairy vetch cover crop, <laughs> crimped that down and planted right into it. <laughs> And, and basically what he did is he made a mulch that's thick enough. Pigweeds, the seeds are so small, they only contain enough energy to grow about three quarters of an inch before they run out of energy. So by making a mulch that's very thick, pigweeds can't grow through it. Plus all the Again, the nitrogen, even though vetch makes nitrogen, all the nitrogen is up in this residue and it has to rot before it's available. And on the corn, you can just put a little bit of starter fertilizer where the corn can get it, but the weeds can't. And then once that corn canopies, all this residue will rot down and release the nitrogen in it. So you can use cover crops to control weeds and then insects. This is um, damage from a pest we have here in Kansas called sugarcane aphid. Uh, right here to the right is a resistant variety. To the left is a susceptible variety. It'll just completely kill crops. But we found that if you put just one pound, one pound an acre of buckwheat, Buckwheat pollen is really high in protein and attracts ladybugs and lacewings because the ladybug and lacewing larva can survive completely on buckwheat pollen. And you can raise up a big crop of ladybugs and lacewings and then later in the summer when the sugarcane aphid shows up, there's an army of predators hungry for raw meat because they've been on a vegetarian diet for uh, life and now they want to get some some live prey and we have never or we've put buckwheat in the sorghum 
we have never had a report of anybody having to spray for sugarcane aphids. And the insecticides takes two application of insecticide to control sugarcane aphid and they're $25 an application at $50 an acre. And that buckwheat is about 75 cents. And of course you can use cover crops to host spiders and other natural predators. This is just a crab spider eating a ligus bug and an alfalfa crop. And take a look at this. Look at all those spider webs out there. Insect doesn't stand a chance. And then crop diseases. I'm gonna show you something real quick, crop diseases. This is, this is an orange tree. Well, it's supposed to be an orange tree. It's almost a dead orange tree, but look at, this is a picture sent to, to me from a, a, somebody we work with down in Florida. His entire orchard grove, you can see a lot of the oranges have been taken out, just almost dead. And you can see the soil is almost dead. And he was just about ready to go out of business. He was taking orange trees out. He was gonna sell the land. And then his kids saw this great big alligator walking across the orchard and they shot it and butchered it. 12 foot long alligator and they buried the remainder of the alligator in the orchard. And all of a sudden, all the way around where they buried that alligator, the orange trees got healthy. And it dawned on them, said that the problem or the, the solution to this, this disease it's called citrus greening. It's wiping out oranges all over the world. The solution to this is in the soil. They've been trying to inject antibiotics and do all kinds of things to cure this disease. And he found out if you fix the soil, you fix the disease. And you can't afford to go, at, you know, you can't shoot enough alligators to bury everywhere in the orchard, but you can grow cover crops to add more biological activity to the soil. And so now he's growing cover crops in his orchard and his yields are actually higher than they were before the citrus greening showed up. And his cost per acre of growing those orchards are one third of what they used to be. They this, all? The, Yo, yes. what, what is the cover crop that they put in there? They grow uh, all kinds of species. Uh, the one in the cover here that it's mostly radish that you're seeing, but they grow a lot of sun hemp. Okay. Um, they they tried cow peas, but cow peas. Well, you can see the yellow flowers here. That's sun hemp. Um, they tried cow peas, but the cow peas climbed up in the trees, made harvest difficult. So they're they're growing mixtures. So sun hemp and radishes. Yep, um, he's grown a number of them, but look how healthy these oranges are. And this is from a tree that was nearly dead mm -hmm. a few years earlier. Mm -hmm. All these trees basically came back to life once he once he had got the soil fixed. And uh, now the trees are capable of fighting off the disease. He used to have to spray the recommended treatment for this disease. It's spread by a little insect, uh, kind of like a leaf hopper. They used to spray insecticide every two weeks, mm -hmm. trying to control this leaf hopper, and their trees were still dying. But once they, you know, the big, big dead alligator that they buried in the in the orchard showed them that the way to cure this disease was by fixing the soil. And so now they're back to, to normal harvest. And then and this is kind of like, this is not his field, but this is what, you know, a good sun hemp cow pea cover crop is doing. This is, uh, this is the same cover crop mixture that I told you about that, that organic farmer is using to provide the nitrogen. And of course you can get additional income from grazing. And because this is at its peak in July and August, 
right when a lot of pastures are drying up and providing no nutrition. So it's a really good way of resting, not only providing uh, more soil health benefits and nitrogen for your, your crop rotation, it's also providing your pastures a break. Down in Florida. Down in Florida. Uh, this is actually, an, uh, this picture, the oranges were in Florida. This picture is from Oklahoma. But this is a similar mix to what he was using in Florida. Just not enough alligators to go around now. You know, people say, well, I don't need that. I've got plenty of grass. Well, if you drive up and down the road, most people don't have plenty of grass. Most pastures appear pretty overgrazed to me, especially in a drought year. But anyhow, I'll, uh, I'll wrap up and One more question um, with the Florida, what um, county were you, was that in? Um, are you working with that farmer or what county are, is, are they in? Um, he did this uh, independently of me. I found out about it after the fact. He's since been working with us, but um, he was just doing a lot of trial and error mm -hmm. and, and figuring out what was working for him. He would be about an hour west of Orlando. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah, um, we have we have landlords um, who uh, they were a huge citrus operation, mm -hmm. um, and they are really struggling and have lost a lot. And I at least want to share this information with them. So. Yes. Um, and if. Uh, I, I took a snapshot of your contact information, so. Yes, and um, it, there's a full story about that project okay. Okay. in our Soil Health Resource Guide, which you can get online. Just okay. Go to greencoverseed.com, and uh, it's got the guy's information. He's started selling cover crop seed. Okay. And, and advising people on how how to take care of the citrus green. I want to try to locate that on the website before we leave here. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, it, it is uh, available. That you can download online. Okay. Um, and of course, you know, I know none of Paul's customers or any of your neighbors are growing citrus, but it, it's just an example of what healthy soil can do for your plants. I mean, if it can bring orange trees back to life from near basically resuscitate them what can it do for corn or soybeans that are struggling with diseases right right thank you yeah what is the website again uh greencoverseed.com okay And, and the name of the publication is Soil Health Resource Guide. Nope. What? I didn't know that. You were growing orange in Florida. No, Caesar. Mm. It's mm. just somebody that we know. Mm. <laughs> ha ha. I I uh I keep trying to find excuses to go to Florida in the winter time, so I found this guy. <laughs> but good for you. Green cover seed G R E E N, right? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yep, greencoverseed.com. So. Thank you. And and uh, Paul, you want to jump in here and tell us a little bit about what you're all about over there?
Yes. What what exactly would you like me to share? Oh. I muted myself. Uh, just tell us a little bit about Pence Group and what you do over there. Sure. Located and everything. Sure. So we're in we're in central Indiana, uh, about an hour northwest of Indianapolis, about two hours southeast of Chicago. And um, we actually got to meet Dale and Keith through um, starting to purchase some cover crop seed that we were reselling. And, um, and now we've become a dealer for them um, in the Midwest. And anyway, we, we, are, we, we basically run an ag service business that services growers in two different capacities uh, mainly. One is doing field drainage and the other is selling seeds. So we, we rep several different uh, brands of corn and soybean and wheat seed. And then we also uh, specialize in cover crops as well. And um, so anyway, we, uh, we've, we've really had a blast learning about soil health. We've got some large clients that are um, taking this to organic um or organic farming thing with the soil with the soil health approach uh to a to a really high level and it's been it's been exciting to be to be kind of a part of that space yeah. awesome what town are you in exactly we're in lafayette so oh my pretty, gosh i was born pretty, in lafayette i'm a hoosier oh okay <laughs> you're a boiler maker or a hoosier I'm a Hoosier. I moved from Indiana when I was 18 months old. My parents okay. moved me, but I'm technically a Hoosier. Well, we're a Purdue fan. All right. Yeah, we're, we're Purdue fans. So when you say Hoosier, we relate that to IU. Uh, oh, 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 no. Yeah, no, I'm an Indiana. Well, okay, I get it. You're an, you're an Indiana Hoosier. Uh, I'm a around native. Here, around here, we say that we're Boilermakers. Boilermakers, I get it. I get it. <laughs> Thanks for telling. Thanks for telling me about you. It's good to know. I wrote down your name. Yeah, and and you're located where again, Natalie? Um, right across Interstate 80, Ottawa, Illinois. Okay. Okay. Yep. yep. So you're probably a couple hours from us or so. Yeah, we're about a three-hour drive. I spent a lot of time back and forth visiting grandparents into Lafayette and West Lafayette, Indiana, over the years. Okay. Okay. Yep. Well, yep. if you're ever if you're ever in town yep. or nearby, feel free to look me up and come out and visit us. Nice. Thank you. Thank you so much. We're starting to do some work with, um, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> this is my little boy, Abram, by the way. Hi, Abram. Hi. Abram is six. You want to say hi, Benjamin? Benjamin's over here too. He's nice. He's my other little guy. He's not. Hi, Benjamin. So anyway, hi. we've had, We've had an exciting morning. So yeah, my, my story is a little bit interesting because I didn't grow up as a farmer. My grandpa was a farm manager, is a farm manager, and my great-grandfather was an extension agent. So we had farmland in the family, but we I, I didn't grow up farming. Um, and so my approach to my approach to how we service farmers is a little bit different because I get, I don't say, well, this is how my dad did it. And this is how my grandpa did it. That doesn't exist with me. So, um, I've been, uh, I've been really passionate about trying to find the best way, regardless of whether it's popular or not. Right. And, um, have been pretty excited to get to work with green cover and Dale and Keith that it, it's, it's a pretty, uh, it's a pretty neat, neat group of people. So nice. That's awesome. It's great. Natalie, you're a grain farmer. Do you use cover crops currently? No. Um, we did do a, a finished out a conservation program with some rye grass that um, on some rented ground that we had to complete the practices through the USDA office or the, the county's conservation office that's the only thing that we have um, experienced we had a again a rye grass application that we had to do and are you guys like a 50 50 rotation or are you we are yeah okay 
Yep. And do you ever plant wheat? No, don't. No. 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 Okay. Don't what type of soils is Ottawa? Is that really good prairie soils or are you timber soils or? Um, prairie soils, I would say we don't have any property really with any timber on it at all, actually. So I, I don't know. I can't tell you all the names without looking at the um, soil sample books, but um, clay. It sounds low. like you're in a, it sounds like all prairie soils, you're in a pretty tough part of the world. Then. Yeah. 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 It's real. <laughs> we shoot for the high yields. Uh. Hey, Dale, one follow-up question yep. that I have is if somebody says, well, what's the difference between growing cover crops and just growing weeds? How do you answer that question? <laughs> uh, because you select the cover crop for a certain purpose. And I know I've been asked that a lot. So why, why don't I just let henbit go? I mean, that's a cover crop, isn't it? I said, well, in a way, because henbit does protect the soil from erosion. Yep. Um, it is a living root, but henbit is also highly allelopathic to corn. It also hosts spider mites. It also hosts soybean cyst nematode. There's a lot of drawbacks to some of these winter annual weeds. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I, I've got, pic, I used to have pictures, uh, you know, where we burned down solid thick stands of hen bit, and you could see right to the line where the hen bit was in the corn stand. The corn only got about three foot tall. That's, you know, there, there are, you could also sometimes say the same thing about cereal rye ahead of corn. Cereal rye is fantastic ahead of soybeans, largely because it sucks up so much nitrogen that you get essentially weed control out of it because the weeds can't function without nitrogen. Soybeans can. They make their own. Well, that's great in front of soybeans. So um, in front of corn, I want something different than cereal rye or in addition to cereal rye that's going to make nitrogen and improve nitrogen availability for the next crop. So right. it's, you know, instead of just taking what grows there randomly, you can have some intelligent design there. You know, it's like if you're wanting to put together a professional basketball team, do you take the first five guys off the street that wander by, or do you go and select big tall athletic guys with talent yep yeah. so what do you what what do you suggest dale let's say let's say i planted a cocktail mix in the fall with mm -hmm. you know vetch and clover and uh oats and annual rye grass and radishes obviously the radishes are gone now mm -hmm. the some the oats are gone now but what's what's coming up is some of the some of the um, mix, but also there's some weeds in there. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, ideally, we want to let the clover and vetch get as big as possible to produce as much nitrogen as possible. Where do you see those two lines crossing from the standpoint of, all right, now the weeds are doing more harm than the cover crop is doing good? Um, it depends on the weed species. You know, some of them, like I said, like henbit can have some allopathic effects. Um, but sometimes some some weeds can be beneficial. And believe it or not, one of the most beneficial weeds is your amaranth species, your pigweeds. Jefferson Institute did a, a study on they planted like 150 different crops mm -hmm. and then planted corn the following year and measured the yields on the corn. The highest corn yields were following grain amaranth. 
Hmm. What do you grow grain amaranth for? It's you can buy uh, it. It's pigweed seed basically, but high producing pigweed. And it, uh, pigweed is amaranth seed is extremely high in lysine. I mean, higher than soybeans. And so they uh, are used as health food. A lot okay. of people buy, like amaranth <laughs> from health food stores. Um, just used as a, a food grain. Uh, extremely Thank nutritious. Um, is, that what you, is that what you've been tasty, munching on this morning? What's that? Is that what you've been munching on this morning? <laughs> no, there's, uh, we do uh, we do use some of our cover crop popcorn for human consumption though. So <laughs> we dig into our seed stash and make popcorn about every day. Yep. So it's like you're showing us your cover crop, Caesar. That's your wheat and radish. I've seen I've seen a lot of a lot of brassicas that overwintered this year. Oh really? Yeah. And, and we we had the we had about the coldest winter in history this year. Mm. And I've had seen but I'm a college student, but I will work with cover crop with Keith and Dale for this summer because it is pretty easy to understand than row crops. I am going to work with Farm Progress for my podcast. I got my meeting with them on. I'm a college student, but I will work with cover crop with Keith and Dale for this summer because it is pretty easy to understand than row crops. I am going to work with Farm Progress for my podcast. I got my meeting with them on Monday morning. Good deal. Awesome. Well, guys, it's been a pleasure spending some time with you. Great to see you again, Dale. Nice to meet you, Natalie. Nice to meet all of you. Dale, I'm going to send you an email because I was trying to find that article. I don't know if you can link me directly to that. I'm going to send you a quick email. I sure can. Thank you so much. Caesar, Nat thank, thank Natalie, you. Natalie, I expect to see some pictures from uh, Ottawa, Illinois, as the first cover crop grown farmers ah. in Ottawa. <laughs> I'll look you up. Okay. All right. All right. Take care, guys. Have a great Thanks, morning. Everybody. Bye bye. Thanks, Caesar. See ya. Bye bye. Thanks, see you, Caesar. Thank you. Yeah, it's me.